The world is full of talented, poor people. Don't be one of them. What's your biggest success? My marriage, I would think. Yeah. Two great kids. I'm in the House of Lords. I'm an entrepreneur. I've made a huge amount of money. I left school at 15, no qualifications. My dad was an alcoholic. My whole life's a success, if you think about it. Welcome to Disruptors. I'm Rob Moore, and on the show we have billionaire Baron Peter Crudders. Peter Crudders is listed by Forbes as a billionaire. He's one of the wealthiest people in Britain. He's also a member of the House of Lords. We go on the whole journey from Peter leaving school at 15, dealing with an alcoholic father, and then buying a 55 million pound mansion cash. So let's get straight in, but first make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. Peter, are banks and money as we know it dying out? Well, first of all, uh, great to meet you, Rob. And you too. Uh, thank you for uh, doing this interview with me. I haven't done many pod podcasts in my time. I didn't realize that uh, people even wanted to do a podcast. So uh, thank you for Thanks that. Thanks for I've doing got, it. Well, I've got an interesting story to tell. So I, I think to answer your question, I think the reason you asked a question is the world is changing quite dramatically now. Um, and the way money is moved around the world um, is done differently. Uh, we don't have checkbooks anymore. Money's moved electronically. When they bring in blockchain, and I'm not an expert on this, but when blockchain comes in through you know different uh, stock exchanges, banking and so on, you are going to be able to buy and sell things real time. And money will leave your account real time and go to the other person real time. So more or less you can do that now with online internet banking. But, um, but in the future, if you were to buy shares, you want to buy shares uh, in Facebook or Tesla, now you click and it takes two or three days to clear. But in the future with blockchain, you will get instant settlement. So the money will come out of your account and the shares will go straight into your share account with whoever you do the transaction. So it's really a wider way of financial products moving around the world, people buying and selling things. I mean, I've just come back up from holiday uh, in Spain and I know you can do everything on your, your card, but I've got a prepaid travel card where I just put 5,000 euros on it. And if I go in for a coffee, I do that because I don't want all these entries going over my main bank account. Right. So I just, I just put 5,000 euros on a prepaid travel card bank. It goes, it doesn't go through my bank account. So, you know, the world's changing. Um, you know, the world's going digital in terms of financing. And, you know, we can talk about cryptocurrencies as well. Don't think they're related, mm. but uh, people like to think that they're related. Um, and I've got a view on that. We can talk about that at some stage. But uh, it's just the way money moves around the world now and how you, you can purchase things like property. You make an electronic payment to your lawyer. They can, they can identify and authenticate you as a person electronically electronically they can get access to you know experience type check-in of you so the world's changing um i i've all i mean i've been banking online probably for about 10 15 20 years i do everything online it's fantastic mm. it's easy so i'm probably torn on this one yes on the one hand the purchasing process of a property is so out of date yes. that it takes six months. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. And that needs disruption. Yes. And that could happen in a day, I yes. believe. And the yes. blockchain could help that. Yes. So in that regard, I see the increased speed of money as a major positive. Yes. But then on the other hand, if we go to like a central digital currency, mm. many banks are closing down. Mm. We might be moving away from cash. Yes. And I'm not talking really from a conspiracy theorist point of view, just the evolution of money, mm. I can see a downside there where maybe if everything is digital and fast, we're also maybe a, could be controlled. What are your thoughts on that paradox? Well, look, the process of buying and selling property is not really getting the money moving around. It's actually all the searches and all the legal stuff that mm. you need to do. 
Um, reminds me of the NHS where you have your medical records electronically. I remember a few years ago the NHS was trying to download everybody's med medical records. I mean, I don't know if they achieved that in the end, but you know, centralise everything. And it's, it's possible nowadays, if somebody wants to do it, and maybe their process is going on, where you can have all the information regarding a property electronically stored securely. And then if you want to buy the property, there's, there's nothing really to stop you being able to buy the property, um, doing it real time. Reminds me a little, I mean, you, you touched on something there. You talked about a digital currency. Digital, there's two types of, probably more than two types, but you know, the thing that I think of is there's two digital types of currencies. So you've got cryptos, that's not what I call a digital currency. And then there's talk about creating a central bank backed digital currency. So that would be a currency, no more cash. I think cash is going to disappear. We don't need it anymore. That's great for government uh, because government can see where every penny goes, where it comes from. Great for tracking uh, criminal activity. But um, I was at a function a, a year or so ago and I saw Rishi Sunak, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. I said, Rishi, do you know, you realise if you get a central bank digital currency, you can collect VAT real time. Just imagine going to a restaurant, swiping your card, swiping your phone, paying £100 for a meal. I know you spend a lot more than that on a meal and you go to these five-star <laughs> restaurants and drink Chateau Lafitte since you started this podcast. Um, but for the rest of us, you know, we, uh, you can go into a restaurant no matter where you go. And every time VAT is charged, bang, goes through to the government. Fuel duty as well. Every time you put some fuel in your car or you charge your electric car, the VAT, the cost of that, the government part of that is could be collected real time. And that would transform and stop sort of tax fraud as well. You know, people avoiding. In the future, I mean, the government, I don't know where we are now because there's a lot going on in government, but they talked about, you know, going carbon neutral by 2030. So all new cars will be battery cars. Now, if people are not buying fuel, you know, how does the government make up that shortfall from the money they make out of fuel, which is quite a lot, I understand, and people charging their batteries? Well, you can charge them for um, charging, but that wouldn't be much, really. So what you would do is you could charge them electronically using a digital currency to move from A to B. So if you, if you drove from A to B um, with your car, you could collect congestion charging electronically you could then charge them per mile so you're going to charge you're going to go one point you're going to do a mile but if you go 1.025 of a mile you need fractional fractional payments and that's where digital currencies come in so i think we are heading we should be china uh, already has a central bank digital currency and the us is working on it we have looked it. I'm in the House of Lords and something came through and the House of Lords decided that it wasn't the right time. I think if I had been on that committee, I would have had a different view. Do you know why they didn't think it was <clears throat> the right time? No. no. I mean, you know, it's inevitable as far as I'm concerned. Um, slightly gets me on to cryptocurrencies. Now, I'm not an expert on cryptocurrencies. My wife said to me once, what's a cryptocurrency? And I said, it's a bit like going onto the internet and playing a game and you get rewards for that game in tokens. And those tokens you can move around and give to other people. I can't really see ever governments adopting cryptocurrency as its fiat currency because governments need to control money supply, interest rates, um, you just can't run an economy if somebody else is printing your cash for you. So there's a lots, of, lots of diverse and different views on cryptocurrencies. I don't think they can ever be mainstream. You will get suppliers saying, you can buy my car and pay me with a cryptocurrency. 
The problem with that is the value of cryptocurrencies can go up and down. So if you valued a car at, say, one crypto Bitcoin, for example, one Bitcoin, 50,000, or two Bitcoins, 25,000, by the time you received the Bitcoins, the value of the Bitcoin could have gone down 10 or 20 percent. So you might only get 40,000 for the car or the yeah. equivalent. Too volatile. It's too volatile. I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of PR. I saw a program. I haven't watched it yet, but I recorded it. It was on Channel 4 last night about Bitcoin. And they said that 3 million people are owners of some sort of cryptocurrency. Um, that's a lot of people. But basically, it's not an investment product because it's not underpinned by anything. It's a gamble. It's a gamble. And I think if you, if you go into cryptocurrencies and look at it as a gamble, then, you know, that's the right attitude. Don't, you know, remortgage your house so you can buy cryptos. I know there's plenty of stories that people have done that and mm. done quite well. Yeah. But if you look at the value of the bit, Bitcoin, for example, it's gone from 40 odd thousand dollars down to $20,000. It peaked at $68,000. Did it? Yeah. Well, you know. But it started at zero, didn't it? Couldn't even it buy a pizza with zero. one. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, a couple of guys here got into cryptos when they were sort of, you know, a hundred bucks a pop yeah. and they're still, they're still laughing. And I said, well, what are you going to do with those cryptos? And they yeah. said, well, we're just going to hang on to them. Um, maybe they're right, I don't know. Mm. Um, but this is the new world that we're in now. When I started this company, this company does basically, we, we allow clients to buy and sell financial products, shares, foreign currencies. And the breakthrough for me was twofold, really, was I invented online trading. Wow. I had the first platform in Europe to buy and sell online. Wow. Um, I had Stephen yeah. Lansdowne on the show, you probably... Yeah, Hargreaves yeah. Lansdowne, yeah, yeah very mm. good company. But mm. they're more on the pensions and investing side. Yeah, We're more on the trading side yeah. because, you know, it's um, people tend to sort of separate out their wealth in their own minds uh, in two or three pots. They have their property pot, they'll have their sort of bank account, cash pot and disposable income. Um, and then they'll have their investments and they'll do a little bit of trading as well. So mm. they might you know, say, well, I'm going to have an account with Hargreaves Lansdowne. They're going to look after my pension. I'm going to have 20, 30 years saving with it. But I actually want to trade a bit of Facebook. Mm. I want a bit of leverage. I want to do a bit of Tesla. I want to do a bit of Bitcoin. Uh, I want to do a bit of dollar buying, buy some gold, buy some oil. Mm. You come to us with that. Right. And I created... CMC Markets. CMC yeah. Markets, yeah. yeah. Just for the listeners, they might yeah. not see the big... Well, yeah. if they read my book, plug, 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 <laughs> Passport to Success, it talks all about the history of CMC and how right. it started. Can you get that on audio as well as paperback? Uh, not yet. I, okay. I don't know. Yeah. The publish, it's up to the publishers. Yeah. But uh, I'm you sure can get that. it on Amazon yeah. anyway. But my breakthrough was two, twofold, really, and it explains my journey of how I went from a humble telex operator at Western Union uh, and got the knowledge of understanding how you could connect. This was back in, well, I, I left school at 15. Uh, I'm not as young as I look, by the way. I was born in 53. <laughs> so I left school when I was uh, 15 and started in 1969 in um, Western Union. And what I saw there was networking. So you, we never had screens back then. We would have a, a, a keyboard with some tape and then we would we learnt to type and we'd we'd have a message in front of us and we'd learnt to type but but that message when you type that message the ticker tape would go from the computer the, the, the ticker tape machine teleprinter to the other side of the world. So I instantly and that was from company to company. Yeah. And I sort of equate that to like the cinema. You go to the cinema, there's lots of people there, you watch a film collectively. So the internet was the invention of the television, if you use that analogy, where you could have that film in your front room just for you and your family to watch. So I understood the power of networking and, um, and I knew that the internet would connect people to people. 
and that was back in 94. I think we had the first web page in Britain. Oh, wow. We certainly sent one of the first emails in Britain. And then the other, the other sort of breakthrough was being able to take and create, and I didn't invent this product, but it's, it's uh, called a contract for difference. What that is, it's, it's a settlement term. Basically, is that a CFD? It's a yeah. CFD, yeah. yeah. And what a CFD really is, is a settlement term. It's not a product. If you trade Facebook, you, uh, you the Facebook price, say, one, $180 a share. But you can trade it as a physical, you can trade it as an ETF, and you can trade it as a CFD. But the strike price where you buy it is still 180 CFDs are a settlement term, and basically they allow you to borrow money and leverage up and buy bigger quantities for a smaller deposit, and because there's all sorts of risk warnings. But effectively, the stars lined up when we launched our internet service. I launched the internet service, and I added to it a generic financial product, the CFD. And what that meant was that you could trade anything you wanted around the world from one account. Prior to that, you would have to have a stockbroking account, a bank account if you wanted to do currencies, a futures account if you wanted to do commodities. Now you can trade everything from one account. Um, and that was really the explosion of um, this company. But also from from individual um, point of view. I mean, I've, I've used this analogy. I'm full of them, by the way. You'll get lots of <laughs> That's data. That's all right. But, I, you know, with the invention of the internet, I, I, I would say it's now possible for a taxi driver to pull over to the side of the road, get his mobile phone out, trade 10,000 different financial products, and here's the key, he will get the same price as Goldman Sachs when they're trading. Mm. The internet generic financial products, the transparency around the internet has driven down literally to rock bottom the cost of executing financial trades from around the world. And, um, you know, we've, we've created or we've expanded that industry. So, and I've been working at CMC for 33 years. I started it in 89, long before you were born. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, yeah. That's very flattering, but I was born in 79. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can't believe that. And, um, but um, so, you know, um, I've been running the company 33 years. I left school at 15. It's all in the book. Mm. Um, and uh, without any qualifications. Wow. Because um, that was something I wanted to just jump in sure. on. It's a question. Um, Forbes have you or had you at 1.3 billion net worth. Is that um, dollars or sterling? Dollars. Right. Is okay. that about accurate? I would say so, yeah. Great. And then you are right up there with one of Britain's most, most wealthy business people and entrepreneurs. Was that a goal? You wanted to be super rich and super successful or was it just a, a liquid evolution of your career? It's a question I get asked a lot. When I was 15, 16, 18, did I want to be rich? Yes, of course I did. Did I want to drive a 1600E Cortina, Ford Cortina, which was <laughs> the, the dog's bollocks yeah. back then? Um, yes, I did. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but my, my, I mean, the best car I've ever seen was an E-Type Jag. Yeah. But I always wanted to own a white Triumph Stag, and I've never owned one. But back then, they were the business, the mm. white Triumph Stag. But I think... The thing is about, um, first of all, I, I've had, in the early days, I had two offers to sell this company. The first one was for a couple of million when we were, you know, one year old. And I thought, blimey, that's a good offer. But I thought, you know, not interested. My dad was an alcoholic. He drank 25 pints of Guinness and a bottle of rum per day. Wow. And, um, How was your relationship with your dad? Not good. He was uh, hitting my mum and then I laid him out when I was 17 and he wow. never touched her again. Broke his nose, smacked him out. He had to go to hospital. But it was pent up. I'd always done well in the city. I've, al I've always worked hard. Um, when I started the company, I didn't, I didn't do it from the back bedroom. I'd worked up until I was about 35. I'd had good bonuses. I've never done drugs. 
My dad was an alcoholic. He drank 25 pints of Guinness and a bottle of rum per day, per day. I was brought up on a Hackney council estate. But what I discovered... And that, that put you off drinking for life then, yeah, did it Yeah, I mean, that? I haven't been in... I couldn't tell you the last time I've been in a pub. I have a drink oh, at the wow. golf club. When my wife and I, we've been married 35 years, she deserves a medal. She's actually got a few. <laughs> but um, but uh, we've been together 37 years. When we used to go out, when we lived in the country, we live in Mayfair now, we would go out on a Saturday night. It wouldn't even enter our heads who would drive. I would drive. I would mm. sit there and drink half a glass of wine all night. I've got some sort of mental block about going into pubs. And wow. um, How was your relationship with your dad? Not good. No. No. Well, if you read in the book, I mean, he was um, he was hitting my mum, and then I laid him out when I was seventeen, and he wow. never touched her again. Um, broke his nose, smacked him out. He, he passed out. He had to go to hospital, but it was pent up, pent up, you mm. know. And so, you know, I mean, I don't like drinking. My kids even joke. Oh, they say, you know, Dad, we're on holiday. You can actually have more than one glass of wine. And I kind of, yeah, it's just a, a mental thing mm. for me, but not and unhappy. has that been a driver, do you Sorry? think? Has that been a driver for your, your success, um, I suppose? But by the way, I don't mind any of my kids or my wife drink. My kids, my youngest kid is 32. She's a vascular surgeon. First oh, wow. kids in my family to go to university. Oh. And one's got an MBA from Imperial Business School and a degree from Edinburgh. Wow. And the other one's got a full medics PhD from UCL and is now a first year registrar, vascular surgeon. So there you go. Um, look, I think the one thing is that when you, when you grow up in a dysfunctional home, it wasn't as bad as it could have been, because uh, my dad was always pissed, so he didn't really know what he was doing half the time. Mm. He worked, but you know he would drink over the whole day. Um, we never had any money. One thing I learned that if I got a bit of money, I could help my mum. And um, that made me feel good because my mum deserved help. She brought up three boys, my two brothers. I've got a twin brother and uh, an older brother. And uh, I always have to apologise to them for getting all the good looks and the money in the, in the family. But, um, you know, that's the way the world works, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. you know? uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm only joking. And... Um, now, I think what happened was that working gave me a structure to my life. I was working at 15. It was actually, someone said to me once, if you'd gone to university, would you be as successful as you are now? And I'd say, if I hadn't been in the Scouts, I wouldn't be as successful as I am now. I think going to university allowed me to think laterally, work things out for myself not have a structured way of thinking so it suited me but I would bend over backwards to send my children to university and give them the opposite education to what what I had but working success gave me security gave me a structure to my life and meant I could help my mum and I don't just mean I mean when you read the book um, I would work a night shift at Western Union when I was 16 I worked the I worked the night shift on Christmas Day at 16 and I had this special shift. Uh, you would do work at 4 p.m. in the afternoon till 8 a.m. No, 6, 6 a.m. And you do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday over two weeks. A long shift, 14 hour shift. Is that right? Four, eight. Yeah, 14 hours. And then um, but frequently I'd finish at 6 a.m and meet my mum and go office cleaning with her because she, we lived just by Old Street. I worked in just off a of London wall. Then she would walk, I knew which way she'd walk. I'd meet her and then I'd do hoovering for her in the offices and then get home about nine o'clock. So it was helping her and also giving her money. I used to give all of my weekly wage to her at the end of the week. I wanted to help her. She's, you know, she took good care of me and my brothers and uh, she didn't have a very good life and I wanted to help her as much as I could and, and then the harder I worked the more rewarded I got salaries and um, and it gave me control over my life 
and starting my own company. I love having my own company. It's almost like you can put, you can make comparisons like going into a pub is a bit of a men- mental block and selling my company is a bit of a mental <laughs> block. What was the second offer you got? How much and when? 50 million pounds. And when was that? That was probably back about, um, so I think it was about 97, 98. It was from a, a bank in the city. Right. And I'll tell you the story. I'm yeah, glad you reminded me. <laughs> um, so um, we had this beautiful country house. By then, the company was five, six, seven years old. We'd invented, I'd invented the internet. We had a platform. Banks wanted to get into it. And um, so that day, I had a meeting with a bank that we had a relationship with. I won't, I won't tell you their name. Um, I'll tell you when we're off camera. All right. but, uh, <laughs> but it's not one of the big, big mega banks. Yeah. You know? And um, what happened was that my wife said, oh, what are you doing today? I said, well, I'm going up to London. I got, I got lunch with these people, you know. Oh, OK, what they want? I said, I don't know, you know, just a, a business lunch, really. I want to see how we're... Anyway, by the end of the lunch, they said, Peter, we want to buy your company. And I said, oh, oh, OK, how much do you want for it? Uh, they said, how much, you know, is it worth? I said, well, we make £5 million a year. Last year we made 100 two years ago we made £200 million. And they said, well, OK, £50 million quid. We'll offer you £50 million quid for your company. It wasn't quite as blasé and relaxed as that, but they said, if every state... Was it all cash down, it wasn't options and all that stuff? Never got that no. far, but it would have been a chunk of uh, thirty, forty million pounds. Yeah. So and then the balance and, and earn out. Mm. So I said, well, I'll think about it, but the answer's no. So I went home that night and my wife said, uh, oh, we're talking, she said, how was your meeting today? Or what was that lunch like? You know, cause I didn't, I said, I just want a sandwich. I've had lunch and, oh yeah, how was the, how was the uh, meeting? And I said, oh yeah, I said, you know, they offered 50 million pounds for the company. She said, oh, that's great, fantastic. I said, no, don't get excited. I said, no. She said, Peter, are you stupid? Like, for God's sake, this could set us up for life. And I said, well, I think it'll, we'll make, it'll be worth 10 times that in the next five years. Why, why do I want to sell it now? We don't need for anything. We've got a lovely house. You know, we've got our kids. They're going to a private school. We're doing okay. Leave me alone. Let me do it. And, and she's been very, very supportive. Mm. I mean, she just wanted to shock me a little bit, but she's always let me make all the decisions and they've always turned out, touch wood, the right ones. Mm. Um, <laughs> I mean, would you, is, have you got a number now? Is there, I think a, is there I a walk mean, away it's, number? It's beyond that. We're a public company now right. listed. I've, I've sold over the years, Goldman Sachs bought 10% back in 06, 07, um, 07 it was, maybe 08. Um, and now today, my wife and I own just below 70% of the company. We're on the stock exchange, so we've got 30% other shareholders. I love being a public company, by the way. Um, Why? 27 years private company, and I just felt it was the right thing to do. Um, and what happened was, um, so I sold 30% and uh, that was fine. We got money for that. But I mean, I don't do stuff. I don't think I answered your question. Why That's all right. I'll keep oh, it there. Yeah, <laughs> keep it there, yeah. you know. Um, but it opens more doors for you. Um, As companies, in liquidity or? Well, you know, we, we've got 300 technology partners around the world. And I think it gives them comfort that we're listed on the London right. Stock Exchange. So we must have gone some through some rigorous testing and we have all sorts of uh, things that we have to report as a yeah. public company. So it gives them a bit of comfort like right. that. And has it helped with scale? Does it make scale more quickly? Um, i tell you what it does do. You get lots of free advice from investors because uh-huh. they want you to do well. Yeah. And uh, although there's these sort of barriers that you can only discuss so much with investors because of insider trading, and we understand those rules and we we don't go anywhere near there, but they will give you some really good free advice because mm. they're, they're on your team, yeah. ultimately. And we're lucky because we've got three or four cornerstone investors that have been with us for a long, long time. And uh, they're there for the long run. So long as I'm in, yeah. they're in type of thing. So, um, and of course, being a public company, you have to do lots of reporting. Mm. But 
I just let others do that. Yeah. You know? I just take the credit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I've earned it after 30 odd years. Yeah. You know? And 70%, was that to retain control? Yeah. 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 I mean, it you know, could have been 51%, but... Um, I Isn't seventy percent another level of control, though? Not uh, technically, no. Okay. But what it, the, the logic behind it was? Um, what's the minimum amount I have to sell? And they said twenty five percent. Right. And then I I, I only owned well I owned ninety percent then Goldman Sachs owned ten percent, so I said right I'll sell I'll sell twenty five percent I don't want to sell any more. Yeah. And. You know, the company's valuation fluctuates quite a lot. I don't quite know why. It's one of my sort of bugbears that I think we we are undervalued as a company because we have spent a hundred million pounds plus on technology. Our technology is superb, but we don't get any credit for that. People just see us as a, a market making trading company that manages risk when in fact you know, 20% of our business is non-risk and 300 technology partnerships around the world. It's very, it's a bit frustrating to get investors to try and understand what you're doing. But no, I just sold 25% and after all the green shoe where they, they have to balance all the share buying and selling, we ended up with about 63% and then we've been doing a share buyback uh, because now you don't need 25% of your company to be on the stock exchange. They right. changed the rule, it's only 10% now. All right. So um, so are you in this for life, in this company and being a businessman for life? You're not gonna retire, you're not gonna sell it all out. I mean, you already got a yacht, haven't you? But you know, you're not gonna buy. Well, first of all, I haven't got a yacht. I've never owned a yacht. Oh, that I is... I mean, I've owned it, yeah, I know sometimes. The research says yeah, you Yeah, I know, yeah, but you don't want to believe everything you no. read in the papers. No, that's why I asked yeah. you about the net worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, um, so, no, I've never owned a yacht. Um, look, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, I'm 69 in a month's time. I'll be 70 next year. I do, I have succession planning within the company. I think you have to have that. And I've got people that have been with me over 20 years that understand the business. But I don't quite know what retirement is because, you know, I love working here. I love coming in. I love the challenge. And I think if you would speak to any of my senior team, they say, you add a lot of value to this company. Um, I do a lot of mentoring now of the people here. Huh. I often say to my senior team, you should be paying me to work here. Because <laughs> effectively, if you think about it, if you look at my success, my door's open to whoever wants to come and see me at a senior level. I can't talk to everybody all yeah. of the time. But they get free, free advice, free mentoring about business mm. and their business decisions. And I, I really enjoy coming in. and. Guess what? If I want a day off to play golf, no one says anything. Apparently, you're pretty useful, aren't you? Low handicap? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't quite know what my handicap is, but let's just work on three handicaps. Wow. I interviewed Kevin fun. Peterson. He's off two, you know. Yeah, the well, Kevin used cricket. to play at Wentworth, where he I was. He still does. At. That's where we went. Oh, does he? Yeah. yeah. See him, yeah. I mean, these cricketers, I once played golf with Ted Dexter. Mm. Um, he unfortunately died, but he was. He was a scratch goal for mm. my God, what a player. But three, three. that's really yeah, well, good. Yeah, it's not bad, is it? That's not really bad for an old boy. <laughs> and, uh, but Kevin hits the ball a mile. Yeah. I don't know him. But, yeah. uh, and by the way, I've just got back from a bucket list golf trip. Oh, yeah? I went to America. Right. And I took my You've mates. You've been signed on the live tour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, £2.50, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I decided, you know, it's my 70th birthday next year. You know, come on. Let's, let's get this sorted out. Mm. So I took my golf coach, two guys from the company, and my golf buddy, and we went off to America. One of them doesn't play. One you of them. F flew your golf buggy to America? No. Oh. We, uh, golf buddy. Oh, buddy. buddy. I thought yeah, you said golf buggy. Bud. I thought yeah, you no. shipped no, no. your own no, buggy I'm not that over. extravagant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, there were five of us. One of them was a golf buddy, a golf guy I play golf with every week. Yeah. Another one was my coach, who's been 20, 25 years my coach. Um, so I mean, that's three of us. And then the other two, one works here and one work, runs my Sydney office. So we took off, we went over on the private jet and I played Augusta National Golf Club. Wow. That was my dream. 
with Sandy Lowell, the 1988 wow, I love Masters Sandy. champion. Yeah. Sandy and Faldo were the two. Well, I, they I used went to play head single to head. figures when I was a kid. Yeah. And yeah, Sandy and Nick, they were. Well, the... Sandy and Nick, well, I mean, Sandy was the trailblazer, really. Mm. I mean, he was such a talented golfer and still is, by the way. And I got the chance to play with him at Augusta wow. National. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I was overwhelmed, to be honest. I had yeah. 40 putts. <laughs> 40 putts. I well, just kept looking at him. 20 actually, over par. Well, when we're going round, I mean, the, the caddies are really nice. They say, oh, this is the Bubba Watson hole. Yeah. Oh, this is the Sergio Garcia. Oh, this is the hole where Tiger. Wow. This is the hole where Sandy Lowe. And um, this is the hole where, um, you know, Nick Faldo won the playoff. Blah, blah, blah. Every hole has a story. And of course, Jack yeah. Nicklaus and there's plaques as you go around. It was a little bit overwhelming and it didn't really matter. I wasn't trying to shoot a good score. No. But we got round to the 18th and it's a famous hole, the 18th, yeah. for Sandy Lyle, for the, your younger viewers. What happened was, and I was telling the caddies, and I remembered it all because I watched it live. And I said, oh, this is where Sandy took an iron off the tee. And he said, yeah, you're right. I took a, and I said, Sandy took the iron for safety and he hit it, he told us, 245 yards of one iron wow. and it went into the bunker on the left and, and for anyone who doesn't know a one iron back then yeah is was virtually tiny. impossible yeah. to hit sandy that. still is a phenomenal golfer and yeah. so much talent and uh, you know so we're on the 18th walking up the fairway <laughs> and we we arrive at the hole where sandy was in the bunker and it's famous because he was the first person ever to win the masters by birdie in the last hole right he hit a seven iron out the bunker onto the green left himself a 10 foot putt go on to youtube you'll see it mm. and then he holds the downhill putt and i said to him this is where your um caddy said look you know, you decide where it's going to go. Dave Musgrave, I think it was. He said, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's mm. right. But we got to the, the bunker on the 18th and Sandy said, oh, come over. And we took a picture of us next to the bunker, pointing to the spot where Sandy hit the shot. Really nice guy. So that was Augusta National, always wanted to play it. Uh, got invited to play it and it was phenomenal, really. But then I thought, well, if we're going to America to play Augusta, they didn't play, by the way. Uh, I, I was the only one that played. It's a long story. And um, and then we went off and we played Pebble Beach and we played we played three courses in California and then we played uh, Kiowa Island, the ocean course, and we played, um, the other one was Sawgrass, the famous 17th hole where there's a green in the middle of a lake and I hit, mm. I, hit I think I hit a rescue seven iron on there and um, two putted and got a par and they give you a little plaque. Nice. We played nine golf courses in 13 days. It was phenomenal. And I said to my wife, look, it's a one-off golf trip. And when I got back, she said, how was it? And I said, it's a one-off golf trip every year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go back. You're making me want to play again. You and yeah. Kevin, it's like I thought I'd retired. You, you know when your best golf is always behind you and you're always trying to catch up? And I just thought, let it go. But now... Um, but if you were a scr uh, scratch or no, single figures... No, like probably five, seven, that well, kind then, of range. You must have the talent in there, you know. You must yeah. have the talent. But um, I, I need... The, the thing is, I've always played sport. I just had two minor knee operations probably five years ago now. And someone said, well, what was wrong? And I said, 50 years of sport. Mm. You know, because as a kid... I mean, I loved playing football and running, and then I played squash, and I'd go skiing, and then I got into golf. And I find that if I don't do something for myself, and I play Saturday mornings, I get up early. I get up early every morning, same time, 6. I wake up at 6, actually earlier, and, um, and I'm in the office by 7.30. You know, I'm not I'm not lying in bed and getting into the office at 10, 10, 30. I'm in here every day before 8 o'clock. Um, but I find that, you know, going out and playing golf, I need that time for myself. I recharge. I play golf in the mornings on a Saturday and I take my wife out every Saturday night. We go out bloody nuisance at times because I'm tired. But we go out every Saturday night. And, yeah. you know, we go out for Sunday lunch or... Um, or we'll go, you know, sometimes in the week, but yeah. I tend not to go out in the week. Now I'm in the House of Lords. Sometimes I'm in mm. the House of Lords. I could come in here, at, get in here about quarter past, half past seven. 
I may be in the house, I, I leave here at say three o'clock, sometimes two o'clock, sometimes four o'clock. I can be in the House of Lords till midnight. But it's very sort of sporadic. I could, you know, mm. for now it's, it's closed as a, a parliament recess. Um, it'll open for a couple of weeks in September, then close for conference season. And then there'll be a run up of government le legislation coming through. Didn't you sue a newspaper? Right? The uh, Sunday Times covertly filmed me. They accused me of selling access to David Cameron for a quarter of a million. I had to resign. I sued the Sunday Times and five judges found the two journalists and the newspapers to be malicious liars. Hey, quick one. Would you like to start a business, scale a business, create multiple streams of income, get better financial education and knowledge, build a personal brand, monetize social media, work from home, create a side hustle. If you'd like any of that, go join my members area, rob.t. Cost you less than a large coffee, one third of the price of Netflix. You can cancel any time with no contract. Learn, earn, invest, build multiple streams of recurring income, digital assets, quicker, easier and cheaper, Zoom masterclasses, live event meetups, Ask Me Anything Lives, exclusive content that we can't put on YouTube because it's too controversial. It's all at rob.team for less than a large coffee. Go join now at rob.team. Mm. Um, I should just say one thing about the House of Lords. Um, people don't really understand the function of the House of Lords. It's a great honour and a great privilege. And people like to knock it. But the function... What do they usually knock it? For well, because they say it's, um, you know, cronies of the uh, political parties, unelected. But the, th the thing about the House of Lords, I'll give you a story. So I was, I, I'm, what the, the House of Lords function is to check, like a compliance department, any laws that come from government, okay? All laws basically are made in the House of Commons by elected politicians that have a manifesto and they get elected by ordinary people that vote and they, they put the government in and then Boris, Prime Minister and so on. And his job is to deliver on the promises of the manifesto. Now, when those promises come through and there's a change in different laws, like, for example, a few years ago, we had the Brexit exit deal, the trade deal with the European Union, they put that legislation through and then it comes into the House of Lords for checking. And the Commons and the Lords work quite well together. Now, what happened was recently they, they asked me to sit on a committee. And this committee was the Charities Commission com Committee. And what government did and opposition, it was a coalition of the, the major political parties in the House of Commons, they asked various charities, Charity Law Society, Charitable Commission, to review the existing laws and recommend any changes that would help charities to become more efficient, better. And the Lords conducted that process. We would call in witnesses, we would call in the Law Society, we would listen and then there were 45 amendments that came up to change and improve the law. Now the Lord's role in that is quite crucial because we do the grunt work for the government. You can get paid for it in the Lords, I don't claim a penny, but here's the point. The chairman of the committee in the House of Lords was the ex-master of the roles, an eminent, clever, legal person that understood the law. Now, he was in there, and I won't mention his name, but this is one of the top legal brains in the country, in the House of Lords. I don't know if he claimed his daily allowance. Uh, if he did, he did. If he didn't, he didn't. But his daily allowance is only £300. I, I never claimed a penny. I won't even claim for a stamp. Why not? I consider I'm doing it for Queen and Country. Right. It's, my, it's me saying to the Queen and the Country, I'd like to contribute to this. 
He oversaw all of that. He managed it. He was the chairman. He guided us all through it. We all had our input. But even if he claimed his daily expenses, £300 a day, is not very much for the master of the roles mm. to conduct a review of charitable law in this country. Mm. So I'd just like to stand up for the House of Lords in that sense that there's an awful lot of good people in there mm. that are contributing to the country and supporting the government's, whichever side, doesn't matter what your political views are, supporting government legislation. Mm. And it's very important because I only tend to read negative press. Lots of people go in the Lords for different reasons. People like to say, oh, he's a big Tory donor. He gave money. But let me tell you the real reason I'm in the House of Lords. I co-founded an organisation called Vote Leave. Remember that? Remember that group? Mm. The ones that won the EU referendum? I co-founded and, and put money in to keep that organisation afloat. And it's all in the book. Mm. Now, whether you're a Brexiteer or whether you're a Remainer, it's not the issue. My side of the argument was, I think we should leave the European Union. And you can hate me or love me for that. But well, that we've had politics. Nigel Farage on the show twice. So yeah, well, Nigel, know yeah, you know, he did a lot for the Brexit cause. Mm. He wasn't connected to Vote Leave. He had his own separate organisation. The reason I'm in the House of Lords is that as a Brexiteer, the country voted the biggest democratic vote in the history of this country. 30 odd million votes. We won by about 1.6 million votes. The biggest democratic process ever witnessed. Vote Leave got 17.4 million votes. Uh, Remain got 16. Maggie Thatcher, Tony Blair, Boris Johnson at their peak never got 17 million votes. So do people. So if you think of the logic, if you look at the House of Lords, it's primarily made up of Remainers, people that want to keep us in the House of Lords. I was put in the House of Lords by Boris Johnson, along with about 10, 10 other Brexiteers. Now, that's representative of the electorate. It's more representative of the electorate than having the House of Lords, which is about 75% remain supporting. Right. So I've been donating to the Conservative Party for 12 years. No one ever put me in the House of Lords for being a donor, even though my pockets are deep. And I never asked for it. Mm. But being a Brexiteer... Didn't you, didn't you sue a newspaper over that? So I sued a newspaper over um, the Sunday Times. It's all in there. But part of the reason I wrote the book, actually, was to lay out my side of the argument on mm. that. But basically, the uh, Sunday Times covertly filmed me. They came in and said that they were donors. They came through the Conservative Party. I was the treasurer and on the board. And they said, um, we want to donate. So I said, OK, yeah, this is what you do. And they said, we want to be a big donor. What's a big donor? I said, well, a quarter of a million. You know, it's all on whatever you donate is public knowledge. That's the law. Nothing to do with me. They accused me of selling access to David Cameron right. for a quarter of a million. I mean, they were, if you look at the backdrop about Leveson and so on. So they, they accused me of selling access to David Cameron, which was nonsense because, first of all, if you want access to David Cameron, it's on the website and it's in a brochure. Join the leaders group for 50000 a year and you can meet David Cameron. So don't quite know that. But to cut a long story short, short um, I had to resign. Uh, I call it constructive dismissal, but there's no hard feelings. What's in the past is in the past. I sued the Sunday Times and five judges in three different courts found the two journalists and the newspapers to be malicious liars. There were two or three uh, claims in there you know, liable and uh, malicious falsehoods, which I won. The last point was that they said, um, the Court of Appeal, they appealed, they said that um, that I was selling uh, tickets to the Conservative Party event, and it was inappropriate, unacceptable and wrong. These are the Court of Appeal judges, that parties should raise money in that way. 
So the Court of Appeal and the defence moved the argument away from what was actually said into a wider context that, oh, it's completely wrong that the Prime Minister should meet donors if they buy a ticket for the black and white party or they for the Christmas party. But that's not what the article was about, the article. So they managed to shift the argument. And right. if you read the process, there's all sorts of dark arts going on. Mm. So effectively, what, what the Court of Appeal was saying, I lost part of the case, but not the malicious falsehoods and the criminality and stuff like that. I won that. Mm. Uh, but what the Court of Appeal moved and their, their team moved, oh, well, actually, it's not what Crud has actually said. It's actually the concept but all political parties raise money through social events. Mm. Anyway, if there's a moral to all of this, is that <laughs> probably best not get involved with politics. <laughs> well, I wanted Stick to ask to what you know. I wanted to ask about that because, sort of, maybe two questions in one. Do the government have enough very successful business people and entrepreneurs advising them? Yes, and. Um, can you balance having a political mm -hmm. career and being a successful business person? Could, maybe they, they could be in two questions in one. Um, so, yes and no is the answer, really. Can you balance a political career and a business career in politics? Yes, I think you can. Does the government have enough smart business people advising them? Uh, probably. Probably. The real issue here is the grief you get once you get involved with politics. The press here are so vicious. Yeah. So, but the real issue here is, you know, is there enough talent that wants to go into politics? Yes, there is. Are there enough business people involved? Probably. But you, once you put your head above the parapet, you seem to be fair game for vicious press. The press nowadays, I think, is completely out of hand. They've become like, um, um, they're not impartial anymore. It's very hard to find true stories, true news. There's a lot of suppression of things that can be negative towards one political party. Um, and there's no balance there. And if you're on the receiving end of that, you just imagine, um, you know, I mean, just imagine the grief that Boris Johnson has had as Prime Minister. Um, and you'll get a load of people mm. shouting at this, saying, well, he deserves it. He well, deserves what do you it. think of his tenure? Well, I think it's he's been very good. I mean, if you think of what he inherited, first of all, government was blocked. No legislation was getting through. Mrs May had some of the biggest defeats ever. You've got, you've got Remainers, you've got Brexiteers fighting it out, and we were in gridlock. Nothing was moving. That's the first thing. Boris came along and has got Brexit delivered. That's delivering on the mandate from the electorate. Whether you're a Remainer or not, it's not the point. You know. Secondly, we had the pandemic. Boris went out and bought vaccines before they were approved. I mean, that, if you want entrepreneurialism in government, there's a very good example there. He went out and bought AstraZeneca, bought 100 million quid's worth, and said, they're mine, even though they've not been approved. Then they got approved. That was smart. And delivered the furlough scheme and, you know, kept people's jobs alive. I mean, you've got to say, fair enough. And at the end of the day, if you don't agree with any of that, there's one thing you can't argue with. Boris got the biggest majority since Maggie Thatcher, 43% of the popular vote, and he won an 80-seat majority. He got a mandate from the British people. And whatever your politics are, you have to respect democracy. And I'm a Conservative. I'm a Brexiteer, so I lean towards Boris. But the reality is, at the end of the day, this is about democracy. And Boris, I think, has been bullied out of office and it's unacceptable. I don't like bullies. Nobody likes bullies. But he's been ganged up on, he's been plotted against. And we should not accept that. We should not accept that as a nation, that someone can be hounded out of office in that way. Um, anyway, 
Let's not get too political. <laughs> but um, the problem is now, you know, once you get involved in politics, the nasty people come out of the woodwork and you get attacked and you get discredited. Um, and is it, a, is it way worse than being a businessman and an entrepreneur? I, I don't can't think of any time I've had any grief in business. Wow. I mean, you control your own destiny and mm. people, people admire me in business. People respect me in business. People respect me in politics, but not on the other political divide, on the other side of my politics. Mm. If you're a Remainer and a socialist, you're going to hate me, basically, mm -hmm. regardless of n not even knowing me. You'll just attack me. I mean, I'm involved with a campaign uh, on Twitter at the moment to you know, put Boris on the ballot. Let the membership decide who the leader of the party should be. Effectively, you had 40, 50 people in Parliament, MPs, that forced Boris to resign. When you've got 100,000 members that voted for Boris to be the leader, and they've been disenfranchised from the process. Mm. It's not about Boris, it's about the process. And, um, you know, if Boris said, look, I don't want to be Prime Minister anymore, I want to step down, I would still continue the campaign because you can't have people hounded out of office. And I hate disloyalty and I hate bullying. And Boris has been bullied by these people and that's completely unacceptable and it's a, it's a disgrace for the Conservative Party. But... That, of course, a lefty attack, <laughs> you know. Well, thanks it's, for speaking so openly about it. Well, you know, it's good to see you, and uh, <laughs> I enjoyed it, actually. You're a very good interviewer because you got me relaxed and <laughs> quite busy at the moment. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Does money make you happy? Definitely. Yeah. I like my life. I have a private jet. I mean, I like nice food. I like going nice places. I like living in nice homes. Yeah, it does make you happy. But ultimately, you're happier if you've got a good marriage. I've been married 35 years. Yeah. Should we do the quick fire round then? Go on in. Go um, for the quick fire. So the way we do the quick fire is maybe about 15 seconds okay. per answer. And right. they're, they're supposed to be a bit more lighthearted, but you can obviously answer them how okay. you want. Yeah. Um, what do you know about making money that many people don't? Oof, don't know, I've never really thought about that. I, I would say that what you should do, if you start your own company, always put the company first. Um, don't, you, you know, it's better to keep investing. You have to keep investing in your business. You get to certain levels and then you have to keep pushing on, pushing on. So I say keep investing in your company and uh, do always do what's right for the company, not for yourself. You can always take money out of a company, but it's, you've got to keep investing. Does money make you happy? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh yeah, I mean, I've just had my golf trip to Augusta National and uh, I like, I like, I like, you know, my life. I don't have yachts. I have a private jet, but it's a net jets thing. It's not an individual thing. Um, and, um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I like nice food. I like going nice places. I like living in nice homes. Yeah, it does make you happy. But ultimately, you're happier if you've got a good marriage. I've been married 35 years, been with my wife 37 years. We've developed together. The business has grown whilst we've been married. We've got two lovely kids and one granddaughter. So, uh, yeah, and uh, so we can have a good life. <laughs> but one other thing I should say is that uh, I'm a UK resident, domiciled here, I'm PAYE. I like paying taxes, I should have said that. Funnily enough, I don't know why, but I like paying taxes. Because, Even when they're as high as they are now? Yeah, because the numbers in this country are distorted. Look, we, we have to stop and think a little bit. So first of all, this is a great country. Every country's got its problems, okay? It's a great country, it's got great internet access, it's got a great legal system, it's got a great policing system. The numbers here are off the scale. If I'd started my company in a small Mediterranean island, the same technology, same concept, I wouldn't be making as much money as I am now. So the numbers are off the scale. The infrastructure that we have, we have stable government as well, I should have added. The infrastructure that we have in this country means that all the numbers are bigger. 
and I feel successful when I pay taxes. I just sent the tax man six million quid. When I IPO'd my company, we sent them 50 million quid. In fact, I was at a dinner with um, Hammond, Hammond, Philip Hammond, and I said, I'm just about to send you a cheque, my wife and I, for 50 million quid. Please make sure you spend it wisely. Um, it, I feel like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any... Uh, I lived in Monaco. It explains it in the book. People mm. say, oh, but you lived in Monaco, didn't pay tax. Big mistake. I, I reduced my tax, but it was a false economy. And I didn't live in Monaco. False economy in what way? The business suffered. Oh, because you were commuting, weren't you? Well, they say I was commuting. Oh. I did used to come every other week, but yeah. I was working from home, emails and stuff. But you lose touch, you lose the day-to-day. It's all in the book. Yeah. Um, but... It was, I, was, I was a tax exile from France. We, we want, wanted to live in Cannes. My wife was born in Paris. She's British, uh, but used to go there as a kid, and that's where we wanted to live. We wanted our kids to go to the international school, learn a language, which they did. And, um, but effectively, we only lived in Monaco because you know, living in Cannes was mo- even more expensive, but it was a false economy. But, you know, since that period, I mean, I come back and I'm PAYE um, and I pay millions in tax mm. and quite doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. You know why? Because I can sleep of a night. I'm not worried about a knock at the door. I never invest in any of these dodgy schemes like, you know, um, EBTs and stuff like that um, or some sort of, you know, wind farm, get your tax breaks and stuff. I don't go anywhere near them. Don't go anywhere near them. Mm. I P A Y E. That's it. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? I, I suppose you could say um, starting the company, but it didn't feel like a big risk at the time. I think it was. I was concerned. You know, I had a good life. I had a house that's probably worth about five, six million pounds now. Indoor pool. Uh, great area, um, Mercedes car, all paid for, no mortgage. Um, but um, I suppose, and then I was working for a company that wasn't going so well. Um, and so I probably had to find another living. I was running all of their operations for them, head trader, running all their risk management and stuff. Um, so I suppose it was starting the company. But my wife, God love her, uh, she said to me, you know what, Peter, start your own company. And if it doesn't work out, we can sell the house. We had a lovely house. We can go move out to Suffolk, somewhere like that, get something, you know, and then we'll have a bit of cash and the kids will go to the local schools. So it's not really that big a risk. I'd already, I was already at a good level. Mm. Not, I, I still needed to earn income, but I had savings, had no mortgage, had a beautiful house. So starting the company was a risk in a way, and it did feel a bit nervy in the beginning, but I like a challenge. <laughs> what about your biggest failure? Ah, oh, um, biggest failure. Don't know. I hope that I've had my biggest failure. I hope there's not one to come to come up in the future. I don't know. I don't, I'm not. I'm not a negative person. I don't think about the bad times I only think of the good times mm. I'm a I'm a guy that's a, a three-quarter glass full you know um, people I think also when you're in a position like there have been so many challenges and obstacles and it, you know I, I think one of the biggest risks was when uh, I started um, the internet I got it's in the book keep saying that we're going to give it a big, big yeah, push at the thank end. Thank you very yeah. much. So there was a knock at my door. I was, we were working in Old Jewry, just by the city, about 30 people in the company. Back then, back in 94, 95, this was early 96, there was a knock at my door. I was in my room. I had a, a place on the dealing desk and a place in my own office where I could do some letters and stuff. And in walks two of my directors. Well, there's only three of us. One was company secretary. Um, um, and one was the accountant and they said Peter look this internet stuff you've just spent a whole year's profit on it we were making about £700,000 a year they said you spent all this money on the internet 
and it hasn't worked. Cut your losses. Are they still in the company? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, cut your losses. Cut your losses. Now's the time. And I said, no, it's going to work. I know. But I didn't know it was going to work. But I had to, I had to sort of support myself. Nobody in the company, out of the 30 people in the company, some of them didn't, didn't really know what was going on. But probably 20, 25 people in the company were not supporting it. I mm. was on my own. I was on my own. That's, and I thought, no, I've, I'm going to, I'm not going to abandon this. This is going to work. This is going to work. And three months later, we got it going. Yeah. So, and I don't really think about failure. I don't have time for that. If something goes wrong, probably there's lots of failures. Things go wrong. Um, just get on with it. Get on with it and stop complaining mm. and keep pushing forward. Um, because, you know, um, the world is full of talented, poor people. Don't be one of them. It's a nice little sound bite there, Harry. Harry's really, mm -hmm. What's your biggest success? My marriage, I would think. Yeah. Um, great wife, uh, love each other, two great kids, successful kids, put a lot of effort into them. Um, I'm in the House of Lords. I'm an entrepreneur. I've made a huge amount of money. I left school at 15, no qualifications. My dad was an alcoholic. My whole life's a success, if you think about it. Um, That's I was the trailer a, there, Harry. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. you, you can you can cherry pick parts of it that have not been good. But what's the point of that? Mm. You know, if you think of my journey, and, and actually I never really think about it, but just sitting here with you, relaxing, uh, enjoying the interview, thinking about it, I thought, well, hang on a minute, you know, I mean, you should see my house in Mayfair. It's a more, we've got seven floors, a lift in it. I mean, I was brought up on a council estate. There's, there's pictures of where I was born, where there were, there were five of us in a two bed flat. My d we never had any money. I never went to a restaurant with my parents. I never went to the dentist until I took myself off at 15, had three teeth removed. So, but it wasn't, we weren't in poverty because my mum worked. My dad worked as well and he would give my mum money, but we never had any spare cash. So if you think of that journey, I've got an IQ of 155. I left school at 15. I was office cleaning with my mum, where I am now in the House of Lords. Um, you know, I've got a doctorate from Oxford University. Uh, I was on the board of uh, Harris Manchester College. Uh, I've got a visiting professor, professor uh, from Loughborough, and I've also got a doctorate from Loughborough. So there's a lot of positives in there, <laughs> and I'm a three handicap golfer, and I played Augusta National, and I played Pebble Beach, and I nearly got a hole in one at TPC Sawgrass. What's not to love? Keep going. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's the most amount of money? Like? Oh, go on. I yeah. had dinner with the Queen, and I went to Prince William's wedding. Wow. You can see me in the front row if you watch William leaving at the end with my wife. Not bad, eh? Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. I used to feed, I fed the corgis under the table, <laughs> the Queen, Queen and Prince Philip. Well, I'm really grateful that we're here and you don't do many podcasts and you've shared all this. So, because <laughs> well, we try and inspire people as well as get realness out, I suppose. And yeah, that's definitely inspiring well i've got and we haven't really talked about this but i've got a charitable foundation uh the peter crothers foundation we have helped 300 charities around the country we uh, and it's self-funded i just put the money in and uh, so far we've given away about 20 million wow but um so what we try to do is help young people from a disadvantaged background and because like the Scouts, I was the biggest donor mm. at one time to the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, the Prince's Trust. I was on the board of the Prince's Trust. I'm, and, on, I'm uh, on their rise board there. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's a great charity. Mm. Um, I got the business loan scheme up and running in Wales. Um, and, um, you know, I, you know, giving back, I, I, I feel like it's part of my job to mentor people and to help people. Can't help everybody, but within my circle, if I see people, try to help my kids, try to help 
you know, people in this work because I love my life. I think I deserve everything I've got. Nobody's ever given me a penny. I've had to do everything myself. But that in itself is more rewarding. And so, yeah, I feel if I can help someone, I mean, I don't mean someone sending me a begging letter. I'll get a few of those. <laughs> I mean, I just want to help people where I can mm. and through a charity. Um, so, yeah. Well, I have the Rob Moore Foundation, which helps young and underprivileged people start meaningful businesses that change the world. Brilliant. So Brilliant. Maybe well, there's something there. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> good luck with that. That's yeah, great. that's probably not talked about enough, is it, that side of business? Well, I think when you, if you step back and think, like, for me, the Boy Scouts is brilliant. I mean, it just got me out of the inner city and got me camping and stuff. But these charities like the Scouts and the Duke of Edinburgh and the Prince's Trust and many more are safety nets for society that governments don't always fund. Mm. But without them, what sort of society would we be? Yeah. You know? And, so, and giving back is very rewarding. I, I said it in my book that, you know, I have met more business people through charitable events than I have through business. Right. It's incredible. Mm. I always say to young kids when I'm talking at universities, I said, there's two things you can do. If you make it in life, if you make lots of money, there's two things that you should definitely do without fail. The first thing is pay your taxes so you can concentrate on your business. If you're running a set of books over here and a set of books over here and telling everybody you're here, you're not 100% focused on your business. So pay your taxes, don't forget about it. The second thing is give to charity because it's a great business move. Give to charity, help to people, help people meet like-minded people, meet other, I've met loads of, I've met all of the top business people through giving to charity. Bill Gates, I've met people wow. like that, yeah. And um, so, you know, that's the secret to success. Pay mm. your taxes and give to charity. And I promise you, I'm not trying to encourage people to do the right thing. I'm telling you, it's the smartest thing you can do from a business point of view, because you're focused, you meet people, and it's rewarding. And you can then just concentrate on being successful. What's the most amount of money you've made in one deal or in one day or at one time? Well, here you go. So I don't know his answer, but I know, I mean, I don't monitor my wealth on a daily basis because a lot of it is in the shares in the company. But I know one day, I probably made about 150 million in one day, but probably lost 100 million in one day when the share price dropped. <laughs> well, that was you the know. next question. Well, so, you yeah. know, if, you, if you've got a company that's, say, worth one and a half billion, which we were at our peak, and your stake in that is a billion, and the shares drop 10% in a day, which they have done, you lose 100 million. Mm. But they can go up 20% in a day. So probably I've made 200 million in a day. But People might get impressed with that, but it's no, re it's no different really to owning your house. I mean, you might buy a house for a million quid and then five years later, it's worth one and a half million quid. Seven years later, it may be worth 1.3 million, but you're still living there. Actually, it doesn't matter what it's worth until you come to sell it. Mm. And when I mean sell it, I don't mean trade up or trade yeah. down. But when you say, right, the kids are grown up, they've gone off, to, you know, they got married or they got, they're off to uni. I'm going to get out of this house and buy something smaller. That's when it matters. Mm. But in the meantime, if you like it and you enjoy it and you pay your mortgage and you pay your rates and you cut the grass, it doesn't matter really what it's worth, is it? Mm. If it's where you want to be. Yeah. What's the most money you've spent on one thing? Probably my house, well, definitely my house in Mayfair probably cost me about 55 million quid. Wow. A bit more maybe. Yeah. It's all in public record. Yeah. Paid 42 million pounds uh, for a mansion in mm. Mayfair. Probably spent another 10, 15 on it. Yeah. The stamp duty. Oh, I've never met anyone like you that loves paying tax so much. <laughs> well, your life's better, isn't it? It's not because you can afford it, but life's better. The stamp Went duty. Went to the accountant, <gasps> said, they said, right, uh, I said, we're going to buy a house. They said, okay, yeah. Whose name's it going to be in? I said, my wife and I. Okay, that's good, they said, because then there's no shenanigans. Five million pounds, stamp duty. 
And I had to rush it through because it would have gone up to seven million. <laughs> so really, I saved two million. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way of looking at it. No, but I'm, I'm only telling you this. Not, I don't need to impress people. I mean, I live my life. I've got my kids. I'm too old for all of that now. I'm trying to tell people how successful people think. Because if you ever get into that position, then you can become a better business person if you think like a successful person. Mm. And that's the point of me telling you this stuff. It's not to say, oh, I spent five million quid on this. You know, mm. I can go out tomorrow and buy whatever I want. Yeah. But I don't, mm. you know, because I'm happy. I'm happy with my life and I'm happy with the company and so on. But if you ever get to that level, then just pay your taxes, mm. give to charity. I promise you, you will become more successful, more successful as a business person and an individual than not doing that stuff. Mm. Right, we're gonna finish on a two-in-one question and then we're gonna talk about your book. Okay. Best advice and worst advice you ever received that you can remember, one of each. Um, oh, well, I can remember uh, the worst advice I've ever received. And fortunately, I never took it up. They said, become a Lloyd's underwriter. <laughs> <laughs> this was back in the 80s. Someone I knew, oh, well, you know, oh, what you do is you commit all of this. I said, well, wh why are they going to send me a check every year? Oh, well, because you have to commit a certain sum. I said, well, how much? And they said, all of your wealth. I said, bugger that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so that was the worst advice, but I didn't take it. The best advice? I can't, don't know. I mean... Uh, Take a three wood and not the one wood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, play it a bit safe. Yeah, a bit yeah. safe, yeah. Mm. No, uh, I mean, I don't know. Good advice? I don't know. I don't know. It's just this, my life is so full every day. There's a thousand decisions. I just keep making them. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. But you just keep moving forward. Mm. And your book? The book. What's it called? It's called... I'm excited to read this. From Milkman to Mayfair. Love it. Port to success. Um, my first job was a milkman and now I've ended up in Mayfair. Um, it's a fun, it's a story in this book. Now I've never written a book before, never had any, well people used to say why don't you write a book, why don't you write a book, get it on Amazon. So it's um, called Passport to Passport Success. Passport to Success, yeah, Peter Great. Gladys. Got um, it. So here's the story about the book. So I was on holiday in Switzerland, skiing, I started reading the book and it was one of Alex Ferguson's books. I'm an Arsenal supporter. Someone bought it as a joke for me. Um, and I got out my iPad and I went through, well, what book shall I read? And I started reading Lawrence Delalio's book, which is quite funny. Mm, he's been on the show. Yeah, has mm, he? Yeah. Mm. And John Daly's book was quite good. But yeah. I like autobiographies. Mm. I thought, right, Alex Ferguson, let's have a read of this. This bloke I've hated for years, who actually ended up admiring what mm. I, I like successful people. Great great success and got nothing but respect for the man even though he beat us a couple of times <laughs> but, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading this book now it wasn't his main autobiography it was some sort of uh, book that he decided to write or he got a ghostwriter start reading I thought this book's crap I can't read this not his main one okay his main one's good I read that so I thought I could do better this and then bang the old light bulb went on. Yeah. And I was sitting in San Moritz in a hotel in San Moritz with my wife and kids. And I thought, do you know what? When I get back, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write my story. And I started writing the book and I wrote 90,000 words in 90 days. I sat there typing. I did it here in the office. The I old ticker days helped you then. <laughs> <laughs> like that. I still yeah. type 80 words a minute, all wow. my emails. Yeah. And I didn't... Uh, so... I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And then I started writing bullet points down. I thought, no, if you can't think of it, you know, don't don't go back to the bullet point. Just write it all naturally. And I wrote everything from memory. And I wrote 90,000 words. And then I parked it. And it just literally, it's the easiest thing I've ever done. It just flooded out of me. It wow. was the right time. Mm. After 90 days, um, no weekend writing, just nine to five writing. I parked it and thought, what am I going to do with this book? And I left it, did nothing. And then I thought, you know what I might do? I might 
publish it, just give it as gifts to my family and stuff like that. And not, and then someone said, yeah, but if it gets out somewhere, they'll write some negative stuff. So if you're going to publish it, publish it or don't publish it at all. Then I got word that was on the list for the House of Lords. I thought, well, I better not publish it. I might piss somebody off. And that might not happen. So I didn't publish it. Then COVID came. Then I got in the House of Lords and I'm still sitting on the draft. And then there's all this negativity about me going into the House of Lords. I've never had so much negativity since I've got into politics. And I thought, this is bang out of order because there's this committee that sits to decide whether you get accepted or not into the House of Lords. Now, bear in mind, I won my court cases. The police and the Electoral Commission said I did nothing wrong. My tax records were all up to, up to date. There was no reason why I shouldn't be accepted into the House of Lords. And, um, and Boris Johnson overrode the commission. First time in 20 years since the commission or the committee has been formed, he said, Kratos has done nothing wrong. His record's clean. You've got no reason to stop this. And he put a letter in the public domain. It's in the book. And then I thought, you know what? Once I got in the Lords, I thought, I've had enough of this shit. I'm going to start fighting back. Fuck it. That's it. And I then wrote another 20 odd thousand words. And I laid it all out there about the court case and the appeal and the dark arts and the, the underhanded things that happened to me the way I was treated by uh, David Cameron, who I call Wardoff in the book, and Andrew Feldman, who was the uh, chairman. Wardoff and Statler. You won't know who they are. No, I don't. From the Muppet Show. <laughs> They're those two old guys, Wardoff yes. and Statler, that are up in the wings, oblivious to what's going on down below, but pontificating about the show. We're not really paying attention, you know? Yeah. And so I called them Wardoff and Statler. <laughs> and, uh, and then about the journey, about how Brexit and stuff. And there's a lot of chapters in there about the court case, but I thought I have to get my side of the story mm. out. And so once I got in the Lords and I still got criticism, I published the book. And I'm glad I did. It's one of the best things I've ever done. And I'm thinking about a second one now. Ah. But I wrote it all myself. And the publisher said, I said, Oh, well, we want copyright over it. I said, look, you know, we want control over what we publish because we're the publishers. And I said, you know what? I tell you what, you can have that control on one condition that if I don't like what you've done, I can walk away and I'll pay your fees and expenses. And they said, fair enough. They literally took out of it. It's probably about 118,000 words. They took out of it a couple of percent of what? Everything in there is what I've written. They, they cut out repetition. They move one chapter forward and mm. put the other one. That's all they did. Everything in there is my own words apart from the quotes. Mm. And um, it was a great experience and I'm proud of it. And I'm proud of my life, what I've achieved. But you know what? The best is yet to come. <laughs> it. So it's Passport to Success. Peter yep. Crudders, if you're listening and watching, go get that book. This podcast is called Disruptors. It used to be Disruptive Entrepreneur back in the day, but we've right. evolved to interview different types of people, not just entrepreneurs. What does that word disruptive mean to you? It's the last question. Um, so it's a, good, it's a good question, actually. And I often use that term in this company. Um, but I think the point is, like, I mean, you can break that down into many things. You can say, what's disruption? You can say, well, I'm going to un undercut a competitor. I'm going to disrupt their market. And all of that applies. The biggest disruption you can do is to yourself, to the company. You disrupt yourselves. Why, as a company, if you've got a successful company and you're doing well, why wait for others to come along and disrupt you? Disrupt yourself. That's what we do. We challenge ourselves in here. We look at our pricing. We're, we're about to launch a big new investment platform. Um, some would say it would rival Hargreaves Lansdowne, but they're a big company. They've been going 20 odd years. Um, but we're going we're gonna to disrupt ourselves around pricing and we're going we're gonna to keep pushing the barriers much higher for people to come in and disrupt us. Mm. So 
be on the front foot with disrupting. Don't wait for others to disrupt you and your business model. Make sure you cannot be disrupted. And then when you've done that, disrupt yourself. We're always challenging. I'll come in and I'll say, yeah, that's great, but you know, you need to invest more money in technology. And you can you can disrupt yourself, not just by pricing, you can disrupt yourself by improving technology. So you, you get a new piece of technology, it's fantastic. And then the question, next question is, well, what are we gonna to do to improve it? Just keep drilling down on it, drilling down on it, and it makes it harder for people to disrupt you. And be honest about it. Be honest about your business model. There are a few companies out there, I think their business models are finished today. Like? Mm, I don't think I should say that. No. Well, what kind of industry? Anybody that brokers right. um, other people's products. I remembered when I first started the internet um, and the light bulb moment to me was that if you were a travel agent, then your business model is not going to last because BA would be able to sell you seats on their planes directly using the internet. Mm. So that business model, that broker in between, um, is where I thought that that type of business would suffer. Mm. So, um, yeah, you know, um, anything where you're selling other people's products, because the manufacturer can sell them direct to yeah. you. And you're seeing that all the time, really, I mm. guess. Even in property, you're involved in property, I guess. Yeah. Property websites and so on. Um, you yeah, can people see. selling their houses themselves, online agencies. Yeah. Recruitment. I mean, we get a lot of people out of LinkedIn now. You, right. You can advertise yeah. job. Yeah, we save millions every year, not by uh, going through recruitment agencies. Recruitment agencies are still doing well. There's yeah. such a demand. There's a million jobs shortage in this country. But... Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, we, we get a lot of talent off of LinkedIn. You mm. go on there, you can see their background. Um, so stuff like that. Yeah. You know? Got to keep disrupting yourself. Keep disrupting yourself. Don't let others do it to you. <laughs> Perfect way to finish. I've had so much fun. I'm really grateful to be here. Thanks yes. for letting us in your boardroom and taking the time out. Really grateful. Well, thank you, Rob. And I actually have to admit, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very thought, much. Yeah, cheers. All the best. Good luck. Yeah, you too. What did you think about that? In all the billionaires we've interviewed, that was maybe my favourite. What about the discussions on tax, charity and politics? Let me know what you think in the comments. If you'd like to watch another billionaire interview on Disruptors, it's right there. Before you leave, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, turn the notification bell on, and remember this, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.